My name is Darrell Willis, D-A-R-R-E-L-L-W-I-L-L-I-S. -L 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 I'm a division chief with the City of Prescott Fire Department. Well, you've uh, all made it to the site where 19 Granite Mountain uh, hotshots died on June 30th. Uh, this is exactly the ground that they died on. This is a, uh, uh, you know, a pretty emotional place to be for me right now. Uh, and I'm sure you all, you haven't had an opportunity to look at this site and you look at the, the vastness of this uh, bowl that they were in. I think you have to put it in context of what they were uh, doing that day. They weren't here all day long. They were actually on top of the mountains to off of my uh, left shoulder to your right. Uh, be, you wouldn't have been able to see where they were actually coming from, but uh, when you get back in Yarnell, you can kind of picture where they were coming from and uh, stuff. You know, they were doing their job uh, that they were assigned to do in uh, one of the basic tenets of wildland firefighting is anchoring the fire. There were structure protection groups that were in place in Yarnell, Model Creek, the Double Bar A Ranch uh, doing structure protection work and basically Granite Mountain had our backs for the other folks that were there uh, fighting the doing point protection on the structures and they were the ones that were going to ultimately along with other hotshot crews and other crews were going to provide a safe work environment or a working area for the others to work in uh, but somebody has to start first so they hiked in uh, not at, from the location that we came in, but a little further north. They hiked in, got up on top of the mountain, and uh, were doing their, their work at, uh, all day long. And I think you've all seen some pictures, of some text pictures that were, that were taken about a lunch spot that they were on. That's about a mile and a half from here. Up, and if you look, at, look above me, you'll see a, a two-track road that leads out pretty much to the ridge line further north and that's where they were at at the time. And then the uh, fire behavior began to pick up that day. And uh, this area that we're standing in right now is all, was all green at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it was 10 foot chaparral, very volatile fuel. Uh, in fact, we would have had a very difficult time. We couldn't have walked in the way we walked in. Normal people can't do that, but hot shots can find their way through. Uh, this was all green at the time. They saw that the uh, fire activity was picking up and it had turned a little bit and there was a line of fire from the ridge top beyond where they were down lower into the valley probably a mile or two mile and a half line of uh, fire in a chaparral that started to move to the south. And uh, you know most of this information I'm, I'm giving you was information that I've gathered uh, based on some of the information maps and stuff like that. I happened to be on the fire on the north end of the fire that day doing structure protection. So I wasn't really involved with what they were doing but we are able to monitor the uh, radio frequencies that they were on and we heard that uh, they were going to move out and uh, start coming in, the, in a southerly direction based on the fire behavior. So if you look up, there's a saddle up there just above this rock pile here. They came through that area and they started to move down in this area. Uh, my thought on it were, was that they were, not they were in a safe location. They were not uh, satisfied and no wildland firefighter is satisfied sitting there and watching the fire progress without doing, taking some action. Uh, they realized that the fire had changed direction, the wind was picking up out of the north, and uh, they, when they moved back into that saddle, they saw the town of Yarnell that was unprotected. They also, if you're up there, and even if you turn around and look backwards, you see that there's a, a ranch just to our <coughs> east down there. And uh, I believe that they were felt that they weren't doing good where they were at. They had to abandon their tactic of trying to anchor and flank the fire and go into what we call point protection and that's to move fire around the houses and protect structures. I believe that that's what they were, their intent was and when they moved down off of there, you know, they're carrying 40 or 50 pounds of uh, tools, equipment in a pack, 
upwards of 70 pounds when you put a saw and the fuel and stuff on their backs and they were moving down to protect this house. That's that's my theory on it. Uh, like uh, Jim Paxson has said, we'll never know uh, because we don't know what 19 of the Granite Mountain hotshots were thinking at that time and there's no con confirmation radio traffic that we're aware of. But they started to move down that hill in that drainage right next to the rock pile over here and they started moving down. And when you have 60, say 60 pounds on your back and you're going downhill, uh, they, you know, it's not, it's a lot easier to go downhill. But just kind of imagine for a little bit having brush in that drainage, 10 foot high, and you're walking down, the wind's blowing, there's a lot fire activity on the other side. They're moving down with their eye on that ranch to go back to protect it. When they got over the saddle and they got below this ridge line of rocks here, the fire is totally blocked from their view. They can't see the fire over in that point. So they've, they've committed to go downhill at this point. At that point, um, that's when things started to change dynamically with the weather. You know, we had some tremendous outflows and uh, the, the uh, Basically, on some fire behavior stuff that we've looked at, the fire was able to come around here and in this drainage and moved up this way. They had committed to go downhill. They were committed to come downhill. They, they probably saw the fire in this area and then uh, were looking for a place because they knew that they had fire on both sides of them. They had fire behind them and now they have fire ahead of them. And so at the site that's fenced behind me, they began to do some work and you know the time frame is really really short that they had to work. Uh, they, car they started cutting out a safety zone with their saws and at about uh, 445 somewhere in that that range uh, the fire was moving up to them. Uh, my understanding the last radio transmission was that they were going to burn out around them and what that means is they were going to light a backfire around the, the circle that they had cut out for their safety zone and then they deployed their shelters uh, there. We had nothing other, we had no radio transmissions or anything else behind them. So the fire came around this drainage and came up this way and uh, for an hour and a half or so, and I don't know the exact minutes on it, uh, you know, we, we lost contact with them at that point in time. So right in that fenced area is where they deployed, where they died and uh, that is basically the events that we know. There's, there's a lot of other things, of other factors that are being considered, you know, the weather and stuff like that that's being studied so that we can really piece back together. But the, the voice of what actually happened, we'll never know. We're not going to have that information from them. But uh, I can tell you that they died with honor that uh, they stuck together. One of the things that, that is uh, very unique about this situation is 19 firefighters saw and felt the same way. They, uh, nobody cut and run the other direction. Nobody tried to get out of the way. They all deployed. They were a very cohesive team um, and they were in a very tight deployment area. All of their shelters were pulled and they all deployed at the same time and they all died. Uh, in this location. Um, from then, that night, uh, the uh, Department of Public Safety, when, the, when the, all of this was going on, you can kind of look back and the whole town of Yarnell is on fire during this whole situation. And uh, so we've got two big incidents going on. We've got a, a crew that's got an entrapment and we've got structures to protect. So the incident continues on. They separate that out, had an incident within an incident. Some of the folks within the incident began uh, trying to get aircraft in, but uh, the smoke was so thick, the column was so high, you couldn't get aircraft in. Once they finally were able to get aircraft in, at the top of this ridge where the two-track trail is, uh, the DPS helicopter was able to find a couple of uh, two or three bladder bags or yellow bags that carry water, and they were left from the previous night. And so it kind of gave them an indication. And then they were able to slip in, in under the uh, smoke column. Uh, they were able to confirm that the, where the crew was, uh, where they deployed. They dropped off a paramedic, confirmed that there were 19 fatalities at that point. 
paramedic got in his helicopter and, and uh, they moved out of the area. The other aspect was we uh, had some folks back in Yarnell on ATVs and when this area cooled off enough they came up on ATVs. Uh, three of our brothers from the Prescott National Forest and actually confirmed again that we had lost 19 firefighters. And uh, at that point, uh, the few of us that were here that were with the Prescott Fire Department determined that uh, we weren't going to leave these guys here. So when it cooled off and stuff, we stayed back a little bit and uh, spent the night up here with them in this vicinity uh, until the sheriff's investigation took place. Um, and uh, the investigation was going to happen at daybreak. Yavapai County Sheriff Scott Masher led that investigation. The sheriff was here on site. Very respectful uh, uh, way that they handled it. In fact, the sheriff even brought 19 flags with us, with him. Uh, and so when they did their pictures and sketches and everything that they had to do uh, about six or seven o'clock in the morning, uh, the, the bodies were bagged and they were lined up basically where we're standing right now. Uh, Ident they uh, had no identification. There were names or numbers put on the bags. They draped flags over the bags. And personnel from the Prescott Fire Department, along with one dad, Danny Parker, his son Wade was one of the fatalities. He's a Chino Valley fire captain. He asked, called me specifically and asked if he could help bring his son off the mountain. And so uh, he helped us. Uh, there was a number of us that did that. We brought pickups in and two at a time took took them out to the uh, to the ranch house and loaded them up into the medical examiner's cars and uh, you know that's basically the story uh, of what happened here uh, you can know you can look around you can speculate you can say a lot of things all i can say and i i don't i know it's getting redundant but uh, I would, have, I would have been with that crew blindfolded. They could have led me down here. I would have been with them. I had complete faith and confidence in the, the leadership, Eric Marsh, Jesse Steed, the captain, all uh, you know, the squad bosses, very seasoned firefighters. They would have never taken a risk that they didn't think. That, uh, you know, it's a risky business, but they don't take undue risk. Very safety conscious. And uh, it's just one of those things that happened. Uh, you can call it an accident. I just say God had a different plan for that crew at this time. Chief, uh, again, I know hindsight is 2020. Uh, I mean, could you comment though on how common it is for a crew when they go into a ridge to leave a member as a lookout? Uh, if they, it, it, when they go into a bowl like this, how common is that? And how does that fit into just general policies of firefighters? Okay, they, they do it every day. They're, they're, you know, one of the things that we really uh, emphasize and they emphasize is look, lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones. But there are points during that work day that you don't have that in place. Uh, they had a lookout. He was on the other side. He had to escape, and that's uh, Brendan McDonoghue. He, uh, he had to escape the Blue Ridge Hot Shots. They were on the other side of this. The Blue Ridge shot, Hot Shots picked Brendan up and he was able to escape. Or he would have been the 20th victim if, if Blue Ridge wouldn't have been there to pick him up. And so we had the lookout in place, but there are <coughs> times in, when they're out here in this environment uh, that you don't have all of those standards in place, and especially with them moving like they were. You couldn't leave anybody behind. Where was Brandon from where we are now? From where we are, he's on the other side of this uh, ridge, this rocky ridge, and there's an, another access road that goes up back in there, and he was behind this ridge over there. So when the crew started moving to the south, Blue Ridge picked Brandon up, and he headed out that way. So that lookout was in, in his, had his escape route, had his safety zone, he was out of there, and these guys were coming around this way. They, they wouldn't have left Brendan down there where he was. They made sure that he was taken care of.